welcome, Nancy. Um, so 10 years ago, 18 year old Garrett uh, came across this book in uh, River Run Bookstore, uh, Song of the Vikings, uh, Snorri and the Making of the Norse Myths by Nancy Mary Brown. And um, I got very excited. Uh, it was this bright, shiny cover, and I get to hear about um, not just somebody who is uh, very, uh, who's very big in uh, documenting uh, the mythology, but um, I also get to hear about the man himself. Um, and it's interesting because now that we've, now that I've started uh, a podcast with someone else, and we're talking in extraordinary amounts of depth. Uh, about the myths and uh, the history, um, I haven't actually heard a whole lot um, beyond uh, Song of the Vikings about uh, Snorri himself. Um, so what started uh, your whole interest in writing uh, this book about this man? Well, I'm really glad to hear that you, as an 18 year old, were inspired to uh, learn more about Sonori from my book because I had exactly the same experience, except it was this book that inspired me. Um, it was the late 1970s and I'm taking a college course on comparative mythology. And on page 20, no, no, 41 in this, uh, in this translation from 1965 of Sonori's Edda, I read, the gods seated themselves on their thrones and held counsel and remembered how, how dwarves had quickened in the earth. And then there's this list of dwarf names, and I recognized several of them, and you will too. Biffer, Bopper, Bomber, Nori, Ori, Owen, Glowen, Feely, Keely, Thorin, Oakenshield, and Gandalf. So here I am, a Tolkien you know, freak. Say, like, what is Tolkien's wizard doing in medieval Iceland in the 1200s? So I had to read Tolkien's biography, and there I learned that he created this club at Oxford University to translate Icelandic sagas, and that he taught Icelandic sagas and was a scholar of Old Norse. And that he took the name Gandalf, you know, from this list of dwarves, but he actually took the character from Snorri also. Um, Gandalf comes from Snorri's tales of the Norse god Odin. And as I describe him in Song of the Vikings, he is the one-eyed wanderer, the shaman and shapeshifter, the poet with his beard and his staff and his wide-brimmed floppy hat, his vast store of riddles and runes and ancient lore, his entertaining after supper tales, his super swift horse, his magical arts, and his ability to converse with birds. All those things are true about Odin and Gandalf. The only thing that Tolkien really added to this character was the pipe smoking and the fireworks. So that encounter, you know, with this little tiny translation of Snorri's edit, it's only actually a third of the, the actual book, through Tolkien started me on pretty much a lifetime of reading and writing about Norse mythology and the Icelandic sagas. And I've now published seven books that have something to do with medieval Iceland. So wow. there's a long answer to your question. All right. <laughs> There's still a good answer, though. Still a good answer. Um, yeah. So <laughs> uh, so why did uh, Snorri specifically uh, take Odin and uh, turn him into Gandalf? Was that the word that they had at the time for him? Or uh, was there something else? You mean it? the name Gandalf? What yeah. does the word Gandalf mean? Well, it. It's in the list of dwarves, but it actually is an elf name and it means the elf with the staff. So like the magic wand. So it sounds more like a wizard than it does an elf or a dwarf. But if you, you know, when you read the old text, especially when you read Snorri, you find that he doesn't really distinguish well between elves and dwarves and wizards and, you know, other kinds of magical creatures. They, uh, they use these words interchangeably. We don't really know what elf or dwarf meant back in the Viking age, because they're just not clearly defined in Snorri or in any of the other texts that we have. So for him to take a name from a list of dwarves and make it into a wizard, isn't really a problem when that name itself means elf. So, you know, he could have done whatever he wanted. 
whether he you know wanted people to think of Odin when they read Gandalf is, is not something that I, I really know, but they are very similar. Their their roles in the story are very similar. Wow, that was interesting. Your fun fact for your uh, pop culture reference of the day. Right. <laughs> um, Tolkien took quite a lot from, from Snorri. Yeah, you know, no. I, I really it's... like those echoes. Yeah, and it's really cool also to see how uh, that, you know, reached out and has survived today um, in uh, the form of very beloved uh, character, a very beloved grandfather-like mm -hmm. character in uh, Lord of the Rings, who's mm -hmm. inspired God knows how many other stories out there. Um, oh, yeah. So that's also a very interesting uh point to bring up is that Snorri at that time didn't fully know what elves or dwarves meant um mm -hmm. and how it's not clearly defined now there's a lot of people out there scholars that do uh tremendous work and um they have their beliefs as to what uh these care uh these elves or dwarves could be um so I'm curious about Snorri's sources when he's talking about dwarfs and mm -hmm. elves and didn't even fully know at the time. Um, do you know what his sources were? Was there anything written? Did he have to go out and interview people? Well, you see, that's the big question. Um, we have a few of his sources, but most of, you know, we assume that much of what he was working from was oral because when he was, in school, when he was taught at the school at Audi, the poetry would have been all taught orally. So he was expected to memorize the skaldic verse. Um, he is actually the first person that we know of who ever wrote down any of these verses. Um, so some of them were written, you know, 800, 900, and he's here in the 1200s, the first person actually writing down the poems. They were carried you know, mouth to mouth for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the reason you could do that is because skaldic verse is so complicated in its rhythm and its alliteration and its rhyme. Um, so that it's sort of like a riddle, you know, you've gotten it right because otherwise it just doesn't make sense. But when you look at the amount of poetry that Snorri has in the Edda, he quotes 373 verses by more than 60 poets. And he just quotes a line, you know, to make a point about, you know, how you use a certain word. And then in Heimskringla, which is his history of the uh, kings of Norway, it's his set of sagas, there are 600 verses. But that's not all the poetry that Snorri knew because like I said, he's only quoting one or two lines from each of these poems and he, must have known the entire poem. So he had this amazing memory, this amazing ability to recall exactly the right line of verse to explain a certain point that he's trying to get across. So he must have had this, this you know, wonderful um, you know, corpus of work just all in his head. Now, how did it get there? Well, we don't really know, but probably because he was taught by other people who also had amazing, you know, memories and had all these poems memorized. Now there are some written uh, sources, and you know we still have copies of. Now there are probably other written sources that we don't have copies of, but we we do have a few. For instance, in Heimskringla, Snorri has the saga of King Olaf Tryggvason. Well, we have an earlier version of that saga written by a man named. Odd the monk, and it's really cool when you when you read these two sagas side by side, you get a really good idea of what Snorri was like as a creative writer, because his scene is not anything like the way Odd the monk would or did, you know, write the same scene. For instance, they both have this scene where the god Odin comes to King Olaf at this place called Avaldsnes. And here I have that ready for you. Uh, Snorri writes it this way. 
One evening when King Olaf was being entertained at Avaldsnes, an old and very wise spoken man came in. He wore a hood coming low down over his face and was one eyed. This man had things to tell of every land and the king found much pleasure in his talk and asked him about many things. Who was Avaldsnes named for? Olaf asked. For King Ogvald, said one-eyed Odin. He had an odd habit, the god confided. He worshipped a cow. He took that cow with him wherever he went and found it salutary always to drink her milk. Ogvald was buried in one of the mounds on the island, and in another place, close to here, the cow was buried. Such tales he told, and many others, about kings and other stories of olden times. Sonora ends his account with the king admitting, this had probably not been any human, but Odin, the god heathen men had long worshipped. And he insisted that Odin was not going to succeed in deceiving him or his men. So there's this, this story set up by Snorri where you hear these wonderful tales that, you know, I only gave you a few of them here, that Odin tells to King Olaf. And then you end up with this question of, okay, so what's Odin's reason for coming? And he's probably you know, not out for good. But then you read the same story in Odd the Monk's version. And yeah, you get some of the, the good tales and you get this idea of you know Odin dressed with the floppy hat and the one eye and the beard and all this, which is, you know, Odin could make him into itself any shape he wanted. So he chose this shape of the old man. Um, and sitting at the bedside of, of King Olaf and telling him stories. But then at the end, Odd the monk ends the, the, the passage this way. The fiend, the enemy of all mankind, who changed himself into the form of the wicked Odin, in whom heathen men have for long past put their trust, holding him as their god. He shows by his visit here that he can no longer endure the torment of his burning envy as he sees the company of his followers fall away. Wherefore, he seeks to catch us in the net of his evil cunning, a net laid with his crafty tricks. For by hindering and delaying us from taking rest at the proper time for sleep, he supposed that we, weighted down by drowsiness, would disarrange or even neglect the appointed time for church. So, you know, this is, this is all we knew about Odin. I don't think anybody would be inspired by Norse mythology. You know, it's like so incredibly overwhelmed with this Christian, you know, moralizing. Mm -hmm. And Snorri just took all that stuff out, just told the stories. Doesn't give us any of that, you know, monkishness. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's, you know, what you can get from reading Snorri's sources that we know of. But the ones that we don't have copies of are the ones that are really the most interesting. You know, of course, each of the poems that he read, that he memorized was a source for some of the myths that he tells. And you know, so we can see uh, in his quotes from poems what came to him and then what he must have made up because there's a lot of missing pieces that he had to fill in. So it's kind of interesting looking at his sources that way too. Okay, that's... It's a very interesting uh, visual. I mean, even then he had to try and uh, fill in the gaps himself, much like mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. how the uh, people who practice the Norse beliefs um, are trying to piece it together. They're also having at times to kind of come up with uh, these, uh, these areas of which it's like, okay, well, you have to go ahead and make this up because we don't have the content. You do. Yeah, because when... I mean, Snorri was the first person to try to write down these myths, and he was already 200 years too late because Iceland had become Christian around the year 1000. Snorri's not even born until 1180, 1178, and he's writing like 1218. So he's like 200 years of being you know, brought up and educated, everybody in the country educated in this Christian tradition where mm -hmm. the gods were devils. And the stories were, you know, to be, you know, ignored, really. Um, you know, they, they, they were just examples of how you could go astray by listening to the wrong stuff. Uh, so 
the fact that we have anything at all is really quite unusual. And the fact that there are gaps um, is not surprising because Snorri's books are not really that long. And he also had very clear reasons for why he was writing. All right. Um, was that, was his motives more for preserving uh, the poetry itself? Um, yeah, I think you could put it that way. Um, he, he had a couple of different um, motivations and it, it's something that, you know, you could, I, I wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> <Let's put> it <laughs> that way. Um, you know, so this is a really good question. What was his motivation? Um, you know, people like to think of Snorri as this scholar or antiquarian that he's, you know, going around Iceland and collecting these, these poems and myths and he's, you know, preserving them for humanity. But, you know, the more I read about and learned about Snorri as a person, it became more clear to me that he's more of a writer, a creative writer in the modern sense. He was out to get rich. He was out to have power. He was out to become famous. He was not actually um, thinking about us, you know, the people 800 years later who might want to uh, reimagine the Norse um, world. He was, you know, had, had very specific goals in mind. Um, he was, like I said, very, very good at liking poetry. He loved it. He wrote it himself. He wrote poems in this very complicated style. And he memorized them as many poems as he could by other people and, you know, share them with people. Um, then he goes to Norway. So he's already a chieftain. He's already an elected law speaker. So he's a very important person in Iceland. And he goes to Norway to meet the king. And this is in 1218. And he's expecting to be named like the court poet. It's called the King's Scald. And that's a position that was historically very important. Uh, you read about it in, you know, well, Snorri writes about it in Heimskringla of all the people from Iceland who came to Norway and became the court poet or the King's Scald and preserved the King's reputation in the verse and the stories of his battles and things like that. So he, Snorri thinks he's going to get this, you know, plum assignment that comes with quite a bit of money and status because he's a great poet. So he comes into to Norway in 1218 and he finds out that first there's a 14 year old on the throne of Norway, King Haakon, and King Haakon would rather read the romances of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table which he was having translated out of French, than to hear these poems recited in his own language about his Viking ancestors. He wanted to be the king of, you know, a chivalric court. He wanted to be like the French and the English. The English king at the time was a friend of his. So this Viking poetry that Snorri so loved, he just dismissed as old-fashioned, too hard to understand, and Snorri did not get you know, anywhere near the, the welcome that he had expected at the king's court. So when he comes back to Iceland, he starts writing his books. And we don't know whether he wrote Heimskringla first or the Edda first, but he's writing these books to impress this young king and essentially to introduce him to his Viking heritage. Now, the Edda is a handbook on how to write Viking poetry or how to understand Viking poetry. And, you know, they talk, he talks about the rules for rhyme and meter and alliteration. And then he introduces this idea of kennings. Now, if you've read or, you know, heard any skaldic poetry, you know, you know that there's these really complicated metaphors called kennings. And, Snorri may actually have coined that term, kenning, and, and he's the first person to really define it. And he says, there are three kinds of kennings. It is a simple kenning to call battle a spear clash. It's a double kenning to call a sword the fire of the spear clash. 
and it is extended if there are more elements. So these kennings, you know, the spear clash and, and the fire of the spear clash are really easy to decipher. But most kennings are really pretty obscure and they refer to pagan myths. So if you don't know the myths, you can't make any sense of the poem and the poetry will then just die out. Nobody, nobody would be interested in just hearing words that they can't make sense out of. So that's why when Snorri wrote the Edda to teach this young king about Viking poetry, he filled it with these tales of, of gods and giants so that the king would understand you know, what the Kennings were all about. And, and like we were talking, you know, it had been 200 years since anybody believed in Thor or Odin. So there's a lot of references in the poems that just weren't clear. And, and so to explain them, Snorri pretty much made things up to fill in the gaps. And some of, some of his um, suppositions are really quite good. And some of them you wonder like, really? Uh, that doesn't fit, Snorri. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, the people who are trying to make a new, you know, Alsa True out of uh, the Norse myths have to give up some of Snorri's ideas because they just don't really fit. Um, a lot of it is this adolescent humor that Snorri brought to the retelling of all these myths. And he did this because he's trying to impress a 14-year-old 14 14-year-old boy king you know so he's telling the stories of you know pretty women fast horses mm -hmm. magic swords you know stuff like that that you know your teenage boys are going to be interested in and he leaves out a whole bunch of other stuff that we really do wish he had talked about okay wow that is uh that is a really interesting uh picture right there are you still here, Nancy? Mm -hmm. You just froze for a moment. Yeah, I am, but you're looking like pretty dark. Like you've gone in. <laughs> <the deep night. laughs> yeah, like it's nighttime. Here, I can make myself. It's warm. nighttime. The sun went down in Maine. Yeah, the sun went down on the coast. So now that there's a little more light, and I'm not living like the 1200s. Um, <laughs> So that so that is a really uh, unique visual right there as to how, uh, or a gr great understanding as to how uh, Snorri was doing this for the, you know the, the long haul of his career. He's gonna gain. He believed mm -hmm. he was gonna be gaining favors with the king. Uh, he's gonna be gaining power. He's gonna be boosting his status, um, and so he added all of these things with the intent of. Um, appealing to a 14 year old which uh is interesting as well because it's one of these things that unfortunately does uh also get overlooked or kind of just summed up into this kind of elevator pitch um uh from uh, other sort uh, or from other people who when covering uh Snorri's writings um so did, did Snorri himself go around and personally interview these people when he was going to collect these sources? Uh, do we know that or did he send people to go collect yeah, them? Yeah, we don't really know. Um, you know, it's it's really hard to reconstruct you know, how he learned what he learned because um, the sagas that tell of his own life leave that part out there's there's only like this this one or two lines that talk about people coming to his estate at Reykholt to copy down the books that he had written mm -hmm. um his his one of his nephews um actually spends the winter copying these books one time and it's it's strange because this is the um nephew that he doesn't get along with and that they end up fighting and uh, the nephew kicks him out of Ray Colt and Snorri has to go on the run, you know? So it's like, why would you give your books to this guy? I, I would love to know the answer to that question, but we, we really don't know. You know, you really, you, you sort of have to situate Snorri in his own culture in order to understand like why he thought this was a good idea. So, you know, what I do in, in Song of the Vikings is I give you more of his biography um, you know, who he was, how he came to be, 
you know, important and, you know, what happened in, in Iceland at that time, because he's, he's really a fantastic character in his own right, you know, aside from his books. He was one of the richest men in Iceland, and he was the chieftain of nine out of the 39 chieftaincies that were in Iceland at the time. So he's controlling a quarter of the country. Um, as you probably know, the first settlers uh, in Iceland were Vikings emigrating from Norway and the British Isles in the late 800s. So he's 400 years after that. But these people had chosen Iceland in part because there was no king and they didn't want to bow down to a king. They established a commonwealth. And for almost 400 years, Iceland got along with no king. So there's no police force, there's no um, no single judge. They had this group of chieftains, 39 chieftains, and a long code of law. So it was sort of a, a representative parliament and the only official elected leader was the law speaker who was required to memorize the code of law and would recite it one third of it at a time at each of the yearly uh, assemblies at the all thing. So Snorri has been elected law speaker already before he's gone to Norway. So he's quite a young man to be elected law speaker. So that means he's not only memorized all his poetry, but he's memorized all of the laws too. They had been written down now, but still the law speaker was expected to know them by heart. So he's like, the key person for the Commonwealth, the independent um, government of Iceland. Now, during his lifetime, this is called the age of the Sturtlungs because of Snorri and his brothers. This little you know, parliament, this proto-democracy self-destructed because the chieftains were all fighting and killing each other. And Snorri is one of the ones who's, you know, doing this, you know, pretty much breaking down this whole, um, you know, 400 year long old democracy because he wants to be an Earl. He wants to be the King's representative in Iceland. He couldn't get the job of court scald, but now he thinks he can get the job of Earl of Iceland. So as the owner of nine chieftaincies, um, we calculate that he could call up an army of about a thousand warriors. And this is in a country that only has 50,000 people altogether. So that's that's quite a lot. And it is important to realize that Snorri himself never fought in a battle. He was not your, your big Viking warrior by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, he's, he's the yeah. guy who is popular because he can pay people to fight or he can coerce them into fighting because he's a great lawyer and he sort of can twist the law. Um, he gives excellent feasts. We know that uh, he's he's always sponsoring storytelling and songs, and and they talk about how much ale and wine and mead he serves. Um, they also say he was a little bit fat and that he had gout, so he was not very mobile in his old age, and he liked to so soak in his hot tub. And that's one of the few things that we have at the estate of Rakeholt is Snorri's original hot tub is still there. Um, you can go visit it, which is really cool. Um, but, you know, you have to think of this, this kind of fat, um, not very uh, sexy um, guy sitting in his hot tub reciting poetry and ordering people about to go fight. And, you know, how it ends up is that Iceland loses its independence. Um, other things about him that you have to know, I mean, he was named the law speaker and he got that position twice so he must have been respected for his understanding of the law but he was not um let's say honest uh, if you want to if you want to talk about a corrupt government it, it was snorri because he would twist the law and he was such a good lawyer so he could out argue anybody that he would always favor himself and his friends. And, you know, the lawsuits always came out, you know, on his side, generally, if he was involved. So people wanted him to argue their lawsuits because 
he always managed to win. But when you're also the law speaker, that's sort of like the main judge, uh, it's sort of a conflict of, of interest there. Um, he was also very self-serving as a family man. He was not at all nice to his wife and his mistresses and his daughters. Um, he married this wealthy woman who was a little older than he was, and then he left her as soon as he had control of her property. He had several mistresses at about the same time. So like all of his kids are the same age. And then he established a partnership. It's not clear that they were ever actually married, but a partnership with the woman who was the richest woman in Iceland. And apparently they were kind of fond of each other because when she died, he was devastated. Um, but you know, he forced his daughters into unhappy marriages so that he could make you know political ties and argued with his sons, mostly over money. Yeah, you know, so he really was not a really nice person. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, before he even finishes the Edda, you know, we, we know that the, the, the book was sort of left in loose manuscript pages. Uh, he gets murdered in his cellar. He's hiding in his cellar when um, the king's men come after him. And he had apparently made a pact with the king of Norway, betraying the other chieftains of Iceland so that he could become the Earl of Iceland. And then he hadn't um, uh, seen it through. You know, he hadn't uh, lived up to his part of the bargain with the king. And so the king picked somebody else to be Earl and told him, go kill Snorri or send him to Norway to you know, explain himself. But uh, uh, Gisser, who was the one who was told, told to go kill him was his ex son-in-law and decided not to take the chance of letting Snorri talk to the king and have his own you know, side of things explained. So he comes to Reykholt and he's got, you know, he surrounds the place with men and he breaks in and here's Snorri, the great Viking hiding in his cellar. And so Snorri is unarmed and is killed. Mm -hmm. So it's like this not very, um, heroic, <laughs> you could say, <laughs> uh, life story. And much of this is written down in a saga that was written by Snorri's own nephew. So it was written a few years after Snorri's death and is probably, you know, pretty, uh, pretty accurate. Though when you're reading this saga, you realize that this nephew didn't like Snorri very much because he doesn't tell you a lot of the good things he could mention, like he doesn't say much about Snorri's own writing, um, but he does, you know, he gives you a pretty good idea of what his life was was like. Now, there's a quick question. So, so you said it, the Edda wasn't finished when Snorri died. Did someone finish it? Well, we know that it wasn't finished because we have, we don't have his actual manuscript copy. You know, we don't have anything from his hand. Um, but we have two copies that are 50 or 100 years later, and they organize the book completely differently so that it's clear that they, they, were, they were not working off of a bound copy or, yeah. or a, a standard copy because things are in, in different order and a uh, different emphasis. So we can sort of say that somebody gathered up a bunch of loose pages and then two different people made versions out of that that we now have. So when you can compare the two different manuscripts, you can see that there was a, a very different way of approaching the importance of, of the three different parts of the Edda and what, right. uh, you know, what it's all about. All right. And so it's, it's sort of, it's speculative, you know, that, that it was just loose pages on the floor, but it, it um, it does seem like, you know, Snorri sets out in the edit to say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and he doesn't quite finish it. You know, he doesn't quite get to Z. Okay. Um, is there anything from looking at the two different versions of what was written down after his death, th does that share anything? Or uh, it... only, Yeah, only to see that, uh, you know, some people thought some parts of the book were more important than others. Uh, whether it was 
uh, written more for the 14 year old king or more to glorify the man who was the regent, Earl Schooley, who was uh, Snorri's friend and was also, um, he revolted against the king of Norway and was murdered, was killed. Um, so it's sort of like it's the it's it's more whether Earl Hal uh, King Halkin was more important or Earl Schooley was more important to Snorri uh, in you know writing this this book, not the actual myths. The actual myths are not changed, as far as I remember. It's been ten years. <laughs> yeah, but you know it's like one of the challenges of of reading this material and trying to pull the story of Snorri's life out of it is that uh, the people who wrote the sagas um, just assumed you knew so much about the time period and the genealogies of people and their connections and what life was like. Um, you know, I have this one example that I like to give in the book of, you know, the stuff that, that they just assume everybody knows. For example, there's a saga about Snorri's father, Kram Sturtla. And it's the first saga to mention Snorri and talks about, you know, his, his, why he got to go to school in, in Audi in the south, which is far away from where he was born in the west of Iceland. Um, so this, there's this long description about a feud over a certain farm that's called Tunga or Deldar Tunga. And you get the idea that this farm was extremely valuable, but there's no idea why in the saga. And when I looked on the map, I couldn't find any reason for it either, because this is not a chieftain's estate. It's not where a church was built. And those are usually the biggest, you know, most expensive farms. So, you know, nowadays you can just Google things. So I did that. And I found out that on this farm was the largest hot spring by volume in all of Iceland. And Iceland has like two or 300 hot springs that are all named. And then when I went to Iceland a few uh, months after that, I went to the farm and there is this, this rock, you know, the side of a, of a hill, really, a small hill. And out of the face of this rock, there are all these jets of hot water just shooting out. And it's, you know, boiling hot water shooting out of the face of this rock. And what I was seeing is just the overflow because this hot spring has already been tapped and is heating two towns in Western Iceland, Borgarnes and Akranes that are like, you know, 30 and 60 kilometers away. There's also, it's also used to heat greenhouses. And uh, since I wrote the book, there's been built a spa on the property. So there's this, you know, hot spring spa that you can go to and soak in the water that, that Snorri soaked in. Um, so there's this hot spring on the farm. Okay, well, why is that important? Well, archeologists who have been do doing work uh, in the area have realized that hot springs were not only useful for cooking and bathing and washing clothes, you know, free hot water, who would not want that in the Middle Ages? But the hot water also spilled into the river, the cold river. And when it flooded uh, over the, the floodplain, um, it was still warm. So you would get this warm water flooding over the grass that makes the grass sprout sooner in the spring and to stay green longer in the fall. And when you make hay in Iceland in the Middle Ages, you're often cutting it underwater in a, in a, a water meadow. So they would be able to cut a whole lot more hay in this area where the hot spring flows into the river than they could in any other part of the valley. So they can make more hay, which means they can keep more cows and sheep and horses and they can get very rich. So you look at the farmer at Tunga and wealth being calculated in cows, you hear that he um, was good for, at the farm was good for 800 head of cattle. And a normal farm would have been like 80 head of cattle. So, you know, this is 10 times as much hay and cows than you could keep, you know, a little bit farther down the valley. So, you know, it's not surprising that it's it started a feud. 
when the farm fell vacant. Everybody wanted to own this farm. And it's to settle this feud that the chieftain from the South, uh, John Lufson, uh, offered to educate Kramsterla's youngest son, Snorri, and took him south to Audi, where there was the best school in Iceland in the early 1200s. And it's at Audi that, that Snorri learns to become a poet. I mean, he was only three years old when he was taken down there, so we know he learned pretty much everything he knew um, down there. He stayed until he married. And so he became a poet there. He learned all this poetry. He learned all the law there. He learned how to write. And um, so, you know, I like to tell people, you can credit your knowledge of, of Norse mythology to this fight over hot water. <laughs> yeah. wow. the, the, the interest, it's always, it's always battles. It's always people fighting over something, which- and Resources, yeah. Yeah, which manages to always give us uh you know the most the most the most valuable information and it was just a big fight over resource over farmland mm -hmm. and hot water i mean that was really something that iceland had that most people you know most places did not have yeah it's free hot water yeah and that really you know gave them a serious advantage throughout the years throughout the ages um now it's just making me want to go to Iceland. <laughs> yeah, you can you can spend a lot of time soaking in that pool and imagining, you know, what it was like back in the old days. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Nancy, um, I I am curious too uh, why Snorri um, also would have uh, jumping back with the gods why he played favorites with certain gods that he was writing down. Yeah, um, that is clear that he liked Odin a lot more than he liked Thor or any of the other of the Norse gods. And, you know, it was traditional to place Odin at the head of the, the pantheon. So there's like 12 gods and 12 goddesses. But Snorri makes him a lot more powerful. He like makes him more like the Christian god the father who's, you know, governs all things great and small. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at, you know, the history of Iceland, the Icelanders had before this time had favored Thor. You know, he's the God of Thursday and Odin's the God of Wednesday. If you remember that. Mm -hmm. um, but the Icelanders, they, you know, they named their children after Thor. We have uh, the Lanama book, which is a 12th century record of Iceland's first settlers. If you, I didn't do this, but somebody else did. If you count up all the names that begin with Thor, you get like a thousand people. And there's not a single person named for Odin in the Landama book. And when you look at the, the records of the first Christian missionaries to come to Iceland, they never found a cult of Odin. They found a cult of Thor and Freyr, but not Odin. So he's, he's rarely mentioned in the sagas. Um, you know, even for a, a good sailing wind, the Icelanders called him Thor. So why is um, Snorri making fun of Thor all the time? He's like, you know, the standard character that Snorri brings in for comic relief, this big, dumb, you know, muscle man. It's because Thor is the god of farmers and Odin is the god of kings, of aristocrats. Mm -hmm. He has the best horse. He has, you know... Um, a gold helmet he has a fine coat of mail he has a spear and he has this gold ring that magically dripped eight matching rings every ninth night so you know there's no problem for him to be the generous lord the gold giver um but snorri says that he also gave men the gift of poetry so this is one of the myths that i and a number of other uh, scholars think snorri pretty much made up because we don't have any other source for this tale of the honey mead that turns drinkers into poets. But being a poet was Snorri's claim to nobility. So other, other than being a poet, he had no reason to be associated with aristocrats and kings. So he has to associate poetry with, with Odin. Um, finally, there's this idea, like I said, that Odin is the all-father 
And his story says, he gave men a soul that shall live and never perish. And he welcomes the righteous to Valhalla after death. This is based on Christianity. This is based on, you know, making a, a one-to-one, um, you know, comparison between Odin and God. Snorri was trying to make these stories acceptable to this young Christian king who had been brought up by bishops and was still very uh, religious. So this is a very tricky thing that that Snorri was trying to do because officially, um, like I said earlier, the church labeled Odin as evil, as a devil, that the, you know, the pagan gods were deliberately trying to lead Christians astray. Um, you know, these myths that Snorri wanted everybody to know because they're so critical to understanding the, the poetry were, you know, just delusions of Satan. So Snorri wanted to make them just entertainment. And so to do so, he he creates this sort of overarching structure for the Edda that says, really, these people were reaching for the ideas of Christianity. They just didn't know what words to use. So they, when they said Odin, they really meant God. So this is, this is Snorri's way of making these old myths you know, palatable and getting them, essentially getting them past the censors, getting them past the bishops to the king of Norway. So there's you know, this question of, was he doing this because this is what he believed or was he doing this just for political reasons? And, and we can't answer that question, but he, you know, he managed to do it because we, we do have, you know, we still have the stories. Actually, we, we don't know that they ever went to the king. They probably did not but at least somebody saw them as being worth saving and, and as not being so in conflict with Christianity that they couldn't be preserved. All right. Thank you for sharing all of this. Yeah. Uh, my last question is, uh, is there anything you would want to share with you know, the world, future generations? Sure. You know, the one thing that we didn't talk about or that you know that I I want to add is, is the goddesses, the Desir. Um, you know Freya, the goddess of love and good harvests, and Skadi, the goddess of winter and the hunt. They are both called Dis, which is the singular of Desir, by the poets of the Viking Age. Um, the Norns are Desir. These you know ancient spirits are are female. They rule the fates of both the deities and the humans. So even Odin has to abide by their, their word. Some Valkyries are called Desir. The Desir include the nature spirits living in the rocks and the hills and the rivers and the trees. And there's many place names in Norway and Sweden that refer to the Desir. Again, they're always female. They're associated with rituals and assemblies and marketplaces, but we don't know anything about them. And why not? Because Snorri didn't write about them. You know, he is he is like our best source of Norse mythology, both in the Edda and in Heimskringla. But in his books, women are either Mary or Eve. They are the honored mother or they're an object of lust. And that's really the way women were looked at, you know, in medieval Christian society. So, you know, this, it's not surprising that Snorri would do this, but it's also part of this idea that he is tailoring this book to a 14-year-old king who is not going to be interested in, you know, the powerful mother goddess that may have existed and the powerful, you know, female deities that may have existed in, in Norse mythology. Snorri gives us little glimpses, you know, of these goddesses in like myths that he just sort of left out. And the one that I like to share is the Norse creation myth. So this is how it goes. In the beginning, there are two driftwood logs, one elm and one ash. They are found on the seashore by three wandering gods. The gods give the wood human shape and bring it to life with blood, breath, and curious minds. Unlike the Christian creation myth, where Eve is an afterthought fashioned out of Adam's rib, in the Norse myth, Embla, the female, and Oscar, the male, are equal. They are made at the same time out of nearly the same stuff. They are as different 
as an ash tree and an elm tree, but they make a good team. Ash wood was used for spear shafts and oars. A good rower is sometimes called an ash person. Elm is used for wagon wheels. And it's also the preferred wood for short, powerful bows. There's one archer who is nicknamed Elm Twig in one of the sagas. So both uh, woods have their roles in peace and in war, rowboats and wagons, spears and bows. Their uses are determined by their size and strength, their resistance to rot or stresses, the denseness of the grain and where they grew. And I like to think that the same was true for the men and women of the Viking Age, that they were equals, that their roles in society were decided not by their gender, but by their ambition, ability, family ties, and wealth. But you won't get that from reading Snorri's books. The mythology that he wrote down is just half of the whole. And I think it's important for people to realize that, that he was being very selective. And I'm grateful for what he did write. You know, he wrote wonderful books. He's a tremendous creative writer, even though he's a pretty lousy person. Um, because without him, we would have really next to nothing about Norse mythology. But it's just sad to think that there could have been more. For example, we know that one of Snorri's daughters, Ingebjörg, was interested in books and in writing. And I really wish that we had copies of the myths that she would be writing down that she was interested in. So that's sort of like, if I could go back in time, that's what I would want to ask, is what Inga Bjerg write. Yeah. All right. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, it's always interesting to hear about uh, some of these very early cultures and beliefs and how uh, they had that remaining tribal approach of uh, everybody is uh, equal and has their part. Mm -hmm. um, all right, thank you very much, Nancy. Yeah, well, thanks, Garrett. Thanks for having me on the show.